Well, the architecture of the report was designed to speak to people's growing impatience with the changes urban growth was making in their lives. We reported on the groundswell of protests emerging in many parts of the country over those changes. There is a new mood in America, the report began. Increasingly, citizens are asking what urban growth will add to the quality of their lives. They are questioning the way relatively unconstrained piecemeal urbanization is changing their communities and are rebelling against the traditional processes of government and the marketplace, which they believe have inadequately guided development in the past. They are measuring new development proposals by the extent to which environmental criteria are satisfied, by what new housing or business will generate in terms of additional traffic, pollution of air and water, erosion, and scenic disturbance. We documented uh, the concerns and acknowledged the legitimacy of the dissatisfactions with specifics from around the country. In the opening chapter, the task force validated these concerns, illustrated them sympathetically, and described people's reactions to them. As one pictured citizen said, real estate is the last frontier. Only now people are thinking of getting up a posse. No growth, growth limits, growth moratoriums, height limits. Wait, stop, stop till we plan. We reported on them all. We acknowledge the currents in some anti-growth protests of exclusion, of racism, or anti-immigrant feelings. But we clearly shared the popular frustrations with what the reflex accommodation of growth and development had resulted in across the country. And we offered policy proposals to address the concerns to control and manage growth with agricultural zoning and tax uh, incentives and ecological mapping and in protection of wetlands and scenic areas. And of course, the constitutional uh, reformulation that empowered regulation to restrict development even as it reduced property values. Celia, call the first cartoon. Is it up there? This. Um, this is Hamilton. Some of you may remember the, the, uh, the uh, cartoons from, from the New Yorker. The new mood stories captured public attention, resonated with environmentalists, planners, anti-development activists, and no growthers. But we were clear that no growth was not a realistic or rep responsible policy for the nation. Our second chapter we entitled, But Grow We Will. And in it, we projected increasing population numbers, immigration, household formation as baby boomers grew up, and more power plants, cars, and roads, and places of employment. We said, while we welcome or fight it, development is going to continue during the rest of this century in the cities and suburbs and exurbs of the nation. There will be more people and more households. And those people and households, barring some unforeseen shift in the preference for low density living, will spread over much larger urban areas than we know today. More people in vast urban regions are what the future appears to hold. Knowledgeable authorities believe that the prevailing growth trends put us on a collision course with nature and ourselves as natural resources run out, pollution bills, and social systems collapse under the burden of stress caused by crowding. We only say that Looking at urban development needs, the die is cast. We must provide for the people who are already here or whose birth is foreseeable under all but the most cataclysmic scenarios of the future. Looking back at the report, I was surprised to be reminded how stern we were in warning that the states could not restrict immigration. Colorado was one state we had in mind, for analysis showed that with current zoning it could accommodate 14 million people. And there was a movement to growth, to cap growth uh, in the air. We concluded that a right to mobility could be inferred from the U.S. Constitution and cited several Supreme Court holdings in support. A chapter entitled Protecting What We Value laid out the case for stricter regulation of significant ecological and scenic open spaces. 
We reviewed British planning law, its successful establishment of green belts around major cities, and its strong protection of areas of outstanding natural beauty. David Callies, who is here, did the research supporting the study of the British planning system, which we actually relied on much more than I had remembered. British constitutional law, we pointed out, permitted severe limitations on private development without compensation to the landowner. And British planning restrictions were not the object of conservative derision or public controversy that far less ambitious restrictions suffered in the United States. Can we pull up God's country? <laughs> the reason for including the British example we had one cartoon went with each chapter, by the way. The reason for including the British example was not that America should try to copy it. It was the very sophisticated mix of measures. You know, public acquisition accounts for only 10% of the London Greenbelt, which was begun at a time of very rapid urban growth, population increase in that region, and nevertheless was very successful. Access agreements, sensitive rounding out deals with towns and villages in the Green Belt, a whole variety of, of procedures help make that so effective. The real point of the chapter was to identify the very, that, the very large pressures that could be anticipated on open spaces and critical ecologies and lay out the full portfolio of approaches for their management. Agricultural zoning, easements, density transfers, environmental impact assessment, wait and see zoning, and also to recommend the institutional mix of land trusts, conservancies, environmental law firms, hunting and fishing groups, which could be enlisted in their defense. We were not naive. We documented recreation needs and recommended large-scale acquisition, purchase, not regulation, to ensure adequate supply and, and protection of beaches and waterfronts and trails. We did not subscribe to the Le Corbusier philosophy of high-rise buildings in islands of green space. Enough was known from public housing to reject that. We explicitly said it would be possible to meet urban growth needs without building up. So although we set out a largely regulatory strategy, we made the case for acquisition, and we understood also, I think, the irresistible force of infrastructure. When Florida opted to site its interstate along the east coast rather than through the center of the state, we knew that the future of the coastal counties was determined, and the character of coastal towns would yield to cars, congestion, and high rises, and no regulations would stand against it. Although we documented and championed a new mood in America, which would go on to receive a lot of publicity and be cited in planning and zoning hearings across the country. We did not fully trust the major decisions about growth to be made locally. We proposed state laws patterned after the American Law Institute Model Land Development Code, which I had also used as the basis for the Nixon administration's National Land Use Policy Bill. It provided state authority to cite development of regional benefit, such as airports, wastewater treatment facilities, areas along major road corridors, and publicly assisted housing. And it also proposed to grant states authority to protect areas of critical environmental concern. Florida was at that time working through the Florida Land and Water Management Act, which adopted the main lines of the ALI code. At the request of then State Senator Bob Graham, I had drafted a letter and obtained President Nixon's signature, strongly endorsing the Florida bill as modeled on Nixon's own. And in announcing the Nixon National Land Use Policy Act, as it was first called, Nixon had said, the time has come when we must accept the idea that none of us has the right to abuse the land and that on the contrary, society as a whole has a legitimate interest in proper land use. Well, having been hired to write that bill and the president's statement and seen it through to inclusion in the Nixon Environmental Legislative Program, I was very happy. Uh, 34 years later, at the inauguration of the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke University, I introduced Russell Train. Uh, to deliver the keynote speech. Now, uh, Train had been chairman of the Council on Environmental Quality and therefore was my boss in the 
Nixon White House. And in the course of his remarks at Duke, he described the experience in 1971 of presenting to the president the environmental program in the way of such things, by then cleared already by the White House, signed off on. When Nixon reached the language on land use, he turned to train and he asked, who's the son of a bitch who wrote this? <laughs> uh, the, the son of a bitch, train said at Duke, is sitting right over there, and he pointed at me. Well, I have to say, as a, uh, as a 33-year-old, I would have been very disappointed to learn what my president thought of my work. Uh, actually, I, was, I guess I was 31. By 2005, I had come to consider, though, that it doesn't really matter what a president thinks or uh, why he does something. It's enough if he does the right thing. And on land use and the environment, Nixon generally did. Well, one could only imagine what Nixon would have thought of the chapter, adapting old laws to new values. It reached deep into the history of English property law, examined the conflicting values involved in development proposals on the shores of Lake Tahoe, on Great Salt Marsh in Connecticut, and in Grand Central Station in New York. We reviewed the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision in Pennsylvania Cole v. Mahan. The case concerned the validity of a Pennsylvania law forbidding coal mining that would cause subsidence under homes, streets, or public buildings. Writing for the majority, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote, the general rule, at least, is that while property may be regulated to a certain extent, if regulation goes too far, it will be recognized as a taking. We are in danger of forgetting that a strong public desire to improve the public condition is not enough to warrant achieving the desire by a shorter cut than the constitutional way of paying for the change. Justice Lewis Brandeis wrote in dissent, arguing that where the facts demonstrate an important public need, even restriction upon the use of, every restriction on the use of property imposed in the exercise of the police power deprives the owner of some right, therefore, theretofore enjoyed, and is in that sense an abridgment by the state of rights in property without making compensation. But restriction imposed to protect the health, safety, or morals from danger threatened is not a taking. The property so restricted remains in the possession of its owner. The state does not appropriate it nor make any use of it. The state merely prevents the owner from making a use with the paramount rights of the public. Strong stuff. And amazing that our task force supported it. Call up God's country. Is that God's country up there? Oh, God's country is up there. You know, what else we got? Call up the next one. We went on to write. We went on to write. Yeah, there's the balance, huh? We went on to write that English land use law regards potential development value as floating and as impossible to tell where the float will settle. And the English also see land values as largely created by roads and public utilities. In its most significant conclusion, then, the task force went on to recommend, and I quote, the United States Supreme Court re-examine its earlier precedents that seem to require a balancing of public benefit against land value loss in every case, and declare that when the protection of natural, cultural, or aesthetic values are involved, a mere loss in land value will never be justification for invalidating the regulation of land use. The task force concluded it is not too late to recognize that Justice Brandeis was right. Looking back at that language, I'm surprised I ever got confirmed. <laughs> well, apropos of the chapter entitled Creating What We Want, which I read for the first time in many years last week, Regulating Development, the reporter for the American Law Institute's Model Land Development Code, Fred Bosselman, read it in draft in my office one evening. He then appeared at my door, obviously moved. He said, this is simply the best exposition of American land use policy and practice I have ever read. It is a masterpiece. 
the writer was Jack Noble. And were Jack not so sick with advanced Parkinson's, he would be here tonight. In it, the task force set out the peculiar challenge of creating quality development. Is it better that people live close together or far apart? That they walk to work, drive, be carried by mass transit? How much social context should we aim for among peoples of different temperaments, incomes, races, ethnic backgrounds? No consensus exists on those issues and none is likely to be forthcoming soon. The decisions that create and shape our communities and regions will continue to be made without ideal development patterns, social or physical. The task force proposed, therefore, that creation, much more than protection, must make its peace with pluralism and use the power of new mooters, these angry people protesting around the country, to balance long-standing development primacy and create institutions capable of reconciling the two values. Call up the, uh, the next, oh, that's, that is the next one. Anyway, run out of cartoons almost. I look back on the report and see that, except for espousing the Brandeis dissent, it's a centrist document. In it, we fully acknowledge that the resolution between protection and creation would be struck differently in Florida and Texas than in Oregon and California. It seems to me that it comes down to culture. David Brooks this past Tuesday, I'm gonna skip some of what I was gonna say about Dallas where I've spent a lot of time in the last few years. David Brooks this past Tuesday contrasted Houston with San Francisco. He noted that since 2000, Houston's employment figures have increased by 32% ranking it number one in percentage job growth. In August, he reported Houston added more single family housing permits than all of California. Houston, you will all re recall, has no zoning. And earnings per job, considering the cost of living, puts Houston among the top uh, for standard of living. African American and Hispanic home ownership rates are much higher than in the, in the Bay Area. And the community is more egalitarian and in many respects a more livable place to raise children, Brooks wrote. He added, the Bay Area is beautiful in the way urbanists like, while Houston is mostly ugly in the way fast food chains like. <laughs> Put up cleared with the state, the next one, I think. Oh, that's not the right one. Actually, actually, this one has an interesting history. It had a different caption. The caption it had was directed at me and my wife, and it had me saying, Libby, there are some things I value more than quality urban growth. <laughs> and uh, I thought uh, that he was messing with me. So I wrote the caption, and that's why it's a crummy caption. His captions are more succinct. Anyway, um, Houston, with no zoning and a come on in attitude, more diverse, less regulated, would never have refused the gift of a major new museum, which the Presidio of San Francisco did this year, which is now going to Chicago, the Lucas Museum most popular uh, exhibition ever that Smithsonian has shown, 600,000 people in six months. But San Francisco is con con confident enough of itself and its, its way of life to do that. Well, reading the Land Use Task Force report today, I'm pleased we allowed for different models in a large country. As others have noted, most Americans have chosen to live in single-family homes with yards for their greater space and safer streets and better schools. When we designed the task force agenda, we did not include an urban chapter. We didn't consider we had enough new to say. Now that's changing. Even vehicle miles traveled in the United States has declined in the last couple of years. Not in my, certainly professional lifetime, has that ever happened before. And that has profound consequences for the future, for pollution, for energy use, and for everything else. In 1989, uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher hosted a conference on protection of the ozone layer, about which she, as a Cambridge-educated chemist, cared very deeply. And we had a chance to have a conversation. I spoke about politics and culture with her. I asked her why it was that British conservatives freely accepted highly restrictive planning controls, whereas in the United States, even more 
more modest regulations occasion the most angry and divisive controversies. She said simply, we understand that living in, a densely set, in densely settled communities on a small island, we have to compromise to get along. Well, the United States has, I think, moved toward the vision the task force set out, and the values and rules in many of our most beautiful areas are different than they were in the 1970s. In others where nature has been overcome or obliterated by sprawl, the new mooters fears have been realized. Where the culture is attuned to the environment, states and cities have found it possible to protect more aggressively and have persuaded courts to sustain them. In other areas, the culture and therefore the politics are different. In both kinds of places, polling indicates relative satisfaction with the results. Different models, but both, I would argue, more respectful of nature and the environment than they were 40 years ago. And as for the development preferences, different cultures. What has made a big difference in California and Texas and everywhere else is local land trust. I agreed to join the board of the Sonoma Land Trust last Tuesday. There are 1,700 of them. They have conserved 47 million acres of land. Local volunteers do most of the work. Their numbers are growing. Spending on monitoring and stewardship and enforcement of easements have more than doubled. There's even a cattleman's trust in Colorado. The Land and Water Conservation Fund has supported 40,000 plus projects. Turns out everybody loves parks. Well, as I look around America now, I'm struck by how Powerful are the portents of change and how Americans' responses to those portents can be so different. Our response to climate change is not solely the province of environment or energy policy. It will require a change not just of city planning but of the culture of cities, supported by citizens and with all the wisdom and creativity of the public and private sectors alike. The Rockefeller Task Force today, I think, would chart the challenges and set out the directions to adaptation made necessary by preparing for climate change. And it would describe the institutions needed to adapt different cultures and values. I will close with a quotation from the distinguished Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who knew something about cities and about architecture and about wise government and getting hard things done. He said, in some 40 years of government work, I have learned one thing for certain. The central conservative truth is that it is culture, not politics, that determines the success of a society. The central liberal truth is that politics can change a culture and save it from itself. Thanks to this interaction, we're a better society in nearly all respects than we were. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>